Electric Avenue. And then to take it higher. Rock it in the daytime. Electric Avenue. Rock it in the night. grey seals on the coastline of the North Sea. Until recently a common sight, but they are now dying in their thousands. To help combat the virus responsible, we still need to find out more about the lifestyle of the seals and their feeding habits. These scientists are here to do just that. What we're trying to do is to find out when the seals uh, leave the haul out on land here, uh, where they go and how they behave at sea. Uh, in particular, we're trying to find out um, how much uh, a food seals require, uh, what food they eat, and uh, where, where they actually catch their prey, where they, where they actually feed. They're attempting to monitor a seal by attaching a radio transmitter which will send out messages about the seal's behavior. The receiver must be placed high enough to keep track over the whole North Sea area. It will be on a satellite. The beauty about this system here is that we don't physically have to be able to follow the seal, be it on land or on an aeroplane, on a boat, which is obviously very expensive. Uh, the beauty of this system is that the satellite up in the sky does all the following for us. Now at the moment we're here, the seals are some way away. What are we waiting for? Well, first of all, as Mrs. Beaton would say, you've first got to catch your seal. Uh, what we actually have to do is get between the seals, uh, which are hauled out on land, physically get between them and the sea, and then we will uh, choose a seal and try to catch it in a net, um, and then we will uh, apply the transmitter. Is that difficult? Uh, yes, it is. It depends a little bit on, on luck, to be honest, but uh, if we can get to the sea before the seals do, then we stand a very good chance of actually managing to catch one. Well, as you say, first catch your seal, good luck. finally caught up with a seal at night and attached the transmitter. Back at Cambridge, where the Sea Mammal Research Unit is based, Bernie explains some of the problems of the technology and the equipment itself. The transmitter has got to be housed in such a way that it uh, withstands enormous pressures when uh, the seal uh, dives deep. Also, the aerial has to be such that when the seal rolls over on top of it, it doesn't break off or, or stay folded over. How do you stick something like that onto a seal? Well, it's quite simple, really, although it wasn't simple at the time. Uh, we use araldite, a simple two-part araldite. And what we do is we mix up the araldite into the base here, which is keyed, and onto the fur of the seal, and then put the two together, wait five minutes, and it's stuck there. And, I can't uh, believe the seals like that. They don't appear to mind at all. And it, it's important to emphasize that if this interfered with the behavior of the seal, uh, then there'd be no point in us doing it at all. The transmitter will come away from the seal when, the, when it molts in uh, February or March. But then the you lose seals. the transmitter? Then we lose the transmitter. However, this actually happens to be a transmitter which was put on a seal, uh, which it was then molted off uh, near House South Humberside, and uh, was actually found by a beachcomber, so we got it back. And uh, we didn't expect to get it back, and we've learned uh, a lot from it on how the various components of the housing uh, stand up to being on a seal. How much 
of the seal's past history goes in any one transmission? Well, the data that I relayed via um, the satellite consists of two, two basic types. First of all, we summarize the life history of a seal over uh, completed six hour periods. And in these periods, we summarize things as the proportion of time that the seals spend on the surface or diving or hauled out. Uh, we look at the mean distance swum in these periods and we look at the number of dives the animal has gone through and the mean depth to which they have dived. Various summary information such as this. In addition, we also uh, include in each transmission some almost real-time information about the past two or three dives. Detailed information such as what we call a depth profile, that is the depth at various stages through the dive. Does the seal just go straight down, swim along the bottom, come up again, or does it go up and down chasing fish at random? What are the main problems? The main problems with this system is we have to keep the, the power requirements uh, very low since the battery is actually held on the seal as well. So it's not possible to have the seal transmitting continuously. In fact, it transmits for a second every minute, which means that a lot of information has to be compressed into a short amount of time. But presumably not every one of those transmissions actually gets through. No, indeed. For, for, the, for a, a transmission to get through to the satellite, uh, three things have to coincide. First of all, you've actually got to be on the second where you are transmitting. That only happens once every minute. Secondly, the seal's got to be on the surface. It's underwater, no transmissions get through at all. And thirdly, the, the satellite has actually got to be visible in the sky. Since it's not up there all the time, it just passes. And on average, we have about 150 minutes of satellite visibility per day. What happens to the information once it gets to the satellite? Once it's at the satellite, the data are stored on a magnetic tape in the satellite until the satellite reaches one of several ground stations. The one we use most frequently is in Toulouse in France. And so we log on to this computer in Toulouse and abstract the data and then try to reconstruct the life history of the seal. This idea of sending information in short bursts is common to a lot of situations where actually transmitting the information is very expensive or consumes a lot of energy. In fact, the same principle applies to sending all kinds of information. Merchant number 4905055, card number 4929801932, the amount 1299. Before you can buy anything using a card like this, a shop will normally check up on your credit limit, and that can take a bit of time. Usually the assistant goes to the phone, dials up Barclay card, waits for a reply, then reads out all the details, your number, your name, the expiry date of the card, the value of the transaction. Then he waits for a confirmation from Barclay card. The whole process could take three or four minutes, and that's time that could have been spent selling. But you can gather up all the information on this card and put it into the phone at one go before you make the call. You see, this magnetic stripe carries all my details. So. This unit will now totally automatically phone up Barclay Card, send them my details and ask for a credit limit. It saves time here in the shop and on the phone lines. This coded information can travel down the phone line much faster than human speech. I'm talking now at about 120 words per minute. That's something like 500 letters per minute on average. But the electronically coded information travels at 500 letters or numbers per second. That's 60 times faster. And remember, it's just using an ordinary phone line. Sign above the dots, please. Of course, the codes that are used need to be standardised. The computer in here and the one at Barclay Card need to agree on a whole host of variables. For example, what's the code that says a message is about to start? How fast is the message going to come down the line? And what's the code for bad line, start again? Every computer, every phone, dialing into Barclay Card from all around the world needs to know those codes and those rules. Otherwise, there'll be no communication.
from the new album called The Gut of a Million Guesses. Here's a track called The Smile and the Whisper. Once the communication links are there, you might as well use them to the full. So there's no need to send parcels of this paperwork to Barclay Card at the end of the day. You can deal with their headquarters direct. It's a totally paperless transaction. At the end of the 18th century, the customs house in London was always full of merchants and their paperwork. Now the ships have moved away down river and the shipping paperwork, which used to fill this room, is being replaced by electronic messages. Of course, originally there wasn't any shipping paperwork. The ship owner would buy cargo in one port, transport it and sell it in another. And it wasn't until merchants started putting their cargo on these ships that there was any need to actually write down a contract or any sort of arrangement. Um, the document that was used, and it's, it's still the most important document in shipping, is one of these, a uh, bill of lading. The bill of lading uh, is a receipt for the goods and it also has got evidence of the contract between the ship owner and the merchant. And its third and very important use is in fact as a pawnbroker's ticket, in that it has to be surrendered at destination in order to get your cargo back from the ship owner. It sounds indispensable. Why are you getting rid of the paper? Well, uh, several reasons. I mean, we get through something like 12 miles of paper a week in our office. That's justification enough. But also, we have to, on the paperwork side, reflect the changes that have happened on the physical side. Over the last 20 years, the boats have got much, much bigger, they're much, much faster, and most significantly, the loading times have been cut from weeks to days. I can still remember the time when you sent a vehicle to the docks and didn't expect to see him back for a week. It was one of the best alibis you could have to say you were stuck in the, the queue at Liverpool docks. The other reasons are that also because the ships are so big, we've had to adopt computers to process the amount of information in the time available. And of course, once you convert data back onto paper, you lose many of those benefits of computerization. They have to be manually filed. There's quite a lot of effort involved. So how did you go about replacing the paper? Uh, basically, the replacement of paper is done by converting the information on a piece of paper into an electronic message and passing that via um, a telephone into a network where it is then collected by the, the receiver. This electronic data interchange, or EDI as it's called, works by using standard electronic documents. The customer need not send the whole document, but only the equivalent of the handwritten portions. One problem though, you described that piece of paper as a pawn ticket earlier on. How do you replace the pawn ticket? Well, that is a good question, and that debate is going to go on for many years. But I think what you have to recognize is that EDI, apart from transferring a paper document to a message, it also gives you opportunities, in the way that the telephone did, to do things in different ways. And the pawnbroker's receipt had to be a piece of paper, when the only way of getting um, instructions around the world was sending a piece of paper. That hasn't been the case now for years. You can send a message electronically, you can send an instruction electronically, and it's instantly received the other side of the world. So there's less and less need to actually have it on a piece of paper. Providing the contract is capable of handling uh, EDI, then your instruction, your final delivery instruction, can be made when the cargo has arrived. P&O needed to move around large amounts of shipping information, and the channels had to be reliable and secure. Ordinary phone lines just would not do. Large computer companies like ICL are of course in the forefront of technological change, and they've had this kind of network for years for their own administration. But not just on one site. Their offices here in Fulham, for example, could send and receive information from, say, Edinburgh as if it were in the next room. Plus, they had the experience of managing the setup. So INS, International Network Services, was born. It offered its customers the opportunity to communicate with each other on ICL's network without the large capital investment of creating their own. P&O containers handed over their paper problems to INS. 
It may seem that the heart of the system is all this, a large room packed with computers connected to lines which crisscross the country. But what you can see, or what you could see if they dug those lines up, is just the physical network of communication. A company like INS offers more than just routes. It offers service, a chauffeur-driven Rolls-Royce for your information transfer. They take full responsibility for what travels on the network. Take an invoice, for example. They'll worry about its routing around the system, about checking that it reaches the correct destination intact, and they'll cope with just about any kind of computer that you care to connect to the network. We're a service industry. Our customers, many of them, have already adopted electronic trading for their UK business. Many of them see this extending into Europe to coincide with the 1992 changes. How long is it going to be before all international trade is done without paper? As a service industry, we have to be ready. This theatre dates back to the 1930s, and over the years it's been pretty well connected. It's played host to such stars as Danny Kaye, and the first of the rock and roll giants, Bill Haley. But of course, times change, and so too does taste in entertainment. These days, the State Theatre Kilburn has been forced to make its connections elsewhere. Full house only, 53 pounds, 15 pence. Eyes down, full house, first number. One and five, fifteen. Three and five, thirty-five. Six and eight, sixty-eight. All the ones, eleven. But even so, over the years, attendances at the bingo have been falling. The large prizes offered by newspaper bingo prompted thoughts of a massive nationwide game run on a central computer. The requirements would be similar to P&O's. Large amounts of information to travel a multitude of routes to hundreds of bingo clubs. It was a computer show. We went round and asked everybody who looked like they might be capable how we would go about this job. And really, not, there wasn't a lot of interest show. Well, why not? Well, I think people thought that we weren't serious, linking up 800 bingo clubs, national game, by computer. And really, there wasn't the technology. It was all new technology. We decided our best bet would be to take on a consultancy to advise us. At the end of the day, we had about six companies that might be able to do it. That was shortlisted, and eventually we finished up with ICL, who became INS. What's your relationship with INS? Well, it's a commercial relationship. They offer us a service, which we pay, uh, uh, and they provide the network and the computer. We have our control room in their building, because for coordination and security, it was best to be cheek by chow with them. Quite a debt. What's the problem with QPA, please? They've got a power cut. All over the country, the clubs sell bingo tickets that are computer generated and printed. The numbers of the first and last tickets sold are sent to game control in advance of the game to prevent fraud. Only then can game control send tonight's numbers to the clubs. That's it, ladies, I'm afraid. Closing ticket deadline. Choosing which of the three random number generators will produce those numbers is initially a surprisingly low-tech job. It's probably on the other part. There it is. The code word is entered. And the generator selected. The numbers are now sent from game control via the network to Kilburn and simultaneously to the 710 other clubs that are playing tonight. What we had to insist upon was that no number was corrupted. Every number had to come through crystal clear in the exact sequence and be correct. And we checked that because at our head office in Dunstable there was a bingo club just along the street. And we go and get their copy of the printout to make sure it coincides with our copy of the printout 
from the control centre and make sure it's right so we know it's the right numbers that have gone out. And don't forget now, the first game will be on your national game flyer, single white flyer. Put all the numbers are in now. So eyes down, national game, full house only. First number. Two and one, 21. Four oh, line 40. Seven and five, 75. 75. Four and one, 41. The security of the network was of prime importance. Do you think you can ever be 100% sure that there's no chance of collusion or cheating or any kind of... Uh, I, have doing been, I have been in the amusement business all my life, and if I said 100% sure, you would, uh, you would not believe me. But this is as secure as it can be, and we employ security people to make sure that there is no element of fraud anywhere in the system. And there are system and double checks of the system to ensure that it is absolutely secure. 60 by 60. 60. 1 and 7, 17. 17. All the 2s, 22. 22. All the 7s, 77. 77. 6 and 3, 63. 63. All the 6s, 66. 66. All the 8s, 88. The communications technology behind this seemingly simple game of bingo is a technology that in Britain is currently growing at 20% per month. Five and nine, 59. Hand up, please. Security numbers 0080 3495. That's a good one. Details of the local winners are sent back through the network to game control. Now waiting for the main frame to prompt me, it has in fact already allocated the prizes and is asking me to check the credentials of the national winner and release the prizes to the clubs. You know, if you think about it, there's an irony to playing bingo that way. The computer here has a list, a record of all the tickets sold tonight. It knows their serial numbers and it knows the game's numbers. Now, we've been sent a list of all the numbers to be called tonight. So, in theory, the computer here could play the whole game internally without the need for all that fuss. Then it would just print out the number of the winning ticket. You, the punter, could just check that against your serial number. If it matches, well, bingo, it couldn't be simpler. Of course, you don't even need to go to the expense of printing out tickets. All you really need to do is sell serial numbers. Yes, but that would be taking the technology just a bit too far. 70, there are other companies offering these value-added network or van services as they're known. IBM, of course, the Midland Bank Network and the old British Leyland system are used by services as differing as dentists and travel agencies for their electronic data interchange. Once you have an industry using EDI, anybody else who wants to trade with that industry also has to adopt EDI and therefore you've got a domino effect. And I think it's this domino effect that we're actually going to see over the next three or four years extend the use of EDI into almost every trading area that there is.